Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments, commanded us to be light to the nations, and who gave us Yeshua the Messiah, light to the world. Amen. So now it's officially Shabbat that we lit the candles, even though the sun's still up. You want to try to get the Shema PowerPoint up? <laughs> so let's stand for the Shema. For those of you, uh, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Baruch Shem Kabod, Malkuto Leolam Bayed. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as a frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. Blessed are you, O your God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, who bestows grace and creates all and remembers the righteousness of the fathers and brings a redeemer to their children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, Helper, Savior, and Shield, blessed are you, O Lord, Shield of Abraham. Okay, so we're trying to get along with the technical difficulties. And for those of you watching on YouTube, it won't matter anyway, right? <clears throat> I always say this is not Hollywood, as you can see. <laughs> so tonight's called Set Free. Since we just had the Passover, which is a freedom festival, we just had Holy Week and the Cross, which is a freedom festival. We had the Resurrection, which Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 is the ultimate sign of our faith, really, because he says, if there's no resurrection, then we're still in our sins. If there's no resurrection, all we did was put our faith in a dead man. And if there's no resurrection, our faith is empty. We're false teachers. We're false preachers false witnesses. And so Paul says the, everything hangs on the resurrection. Because if Jesus never rose, then what does it all mean? I mean, if his body's still buried somewhere, like everybody else who's died, doesn't mean that much to us. So it's the ultimate sign that his sacrifice was acceptable, that his sacrifice was the true Passover, and amen. And as you study Torah and you see all this blood atonement and all these things which, you know, to our ears seem so weird, it's prefiguring what Messiah does. So if you're a believer in Yeshua, if you're a believer in what happened at the cross, you know that that's how you're saved. You know that that's how your sin is paid for. And like I said, I think last time, or maybe it was somewhere else, you know, we could we can go back here and say we're going to kill some lambs to atone for our sins. But guess what? When we're done and we clean up the mess, we're still going to be in our sins. So the resurrection was the ultimate sign. And you really, I think that was, might have been the radio show last week. Uh, yeah, First Corinthians 15. If, if if you haven't read it for a while, you really should read it for your homework because it's so powerful. Is this even on? Anyway, I don't know. So it's called Set Free. So we're going to go to 
2 Corinthians chapter 3. It looks like I put too much stuff on the slides, but that's okay. Monica wasn't here to fix it. So, <laughs> but you know, on the, on the TV thing, Jason, whenever I put these kind of slides up, it goes off of the thing and it looks ridiculous. And then I can't fix it once it's going. But, but anyway, um, <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter three, starting in two. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Okay, so because of what's happened, because of what we believe, because we've been set free by Yeshua, we can be bold with our speech. Because we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we're bold with our speech. You know, we didn't sit around we don't sit around and go, Yeah, well, you know, Jesus died for me and I'm just really glad and you know, maybe no, we're bold in our speech. Was Paul bold in his speech? Oh yeah. So therefore, since we have such hope, as we just talked about, we we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. The veil that covers the scripture, of course, you don't you can't understand the scripture in its fullness until you know Yeshua and you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Right? Like we always say, the Bible is the only book you can read that the author is with you while you're reading it. Because he wrote it, the Holy Spirit wrote it. The Ruach wrote the scripture. And he's you can ask him. If you don't understand what something means, you can ask him. He'll try to explain it to you in your little mind. And, you know, if that doesn't work, you can go to somebody who's been studying something for a while. But there's different levels of understanding, as, as I'm sure you all know. But it was impossible to understand just from Torah what was going to happen in the year, let's say it's 33 AD, although it might not have been 33, but we'll just say that. The, the events that happened during the week we call Holy Week, which culminate in the death on the cross and then the resurrection, couldn't possibly have been understood by the people who were in the wilderness. Now, Jesus, Yeshua in John 5 says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me because Moses wrote about me. Wait a minute, Moses wrote about you? I don't see your name in the Torah. I don't see your name in Exodus. I don't see your name in any of those books. But as we've been talking about in the Torah class, what he wrote about was the types and shadows of what was going to come. And it was all about blood atonement. It was all about law, keep the law. You're not righteous if you don't keep the law. So guess how many people would be righteous? Zero. So there has to be a way to solve the problem. They couldn't understand it. But the law is holy. Moses was the servant. Moses was filled with the Spirit of God in the sense, not quite like we are, but in a similar sense. And we know that when he came down from the mountain and when he came out of the tent, he glowed. And they had to cover his face. They said, dude, what's with this face? Put something over that. Where's Jordan? Put something over that face. You know, we can't sleep over here because you're glowing. So what Paul's saying here is the people reading the Old Testament that aren't believers still have that veil over it. They can't understand what it means. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Now, you can't have freedom in the law. If you're worried every second about how you're doing with the law, it's pretty tough to be joyous. 
pretty tough to be joyous because you have to worry. You might stand in the wrong place. You might say the prayer wrong. You might light the candle wrong. Maybe you took too many steps today and it's the Sabbath. You know, Paul tells us in Romans, the law is holy. The problem is we can't keep the law. The law is a mirror that shows us what our sin is. It doesn't mean that the law is some dirty trick that we can't do. We can't do it because we have a flawed nature. To be righteous, you have to keep the law. So when you don't keep the law, you're not righteous. Go get another lamb. Go get another lamb. Go get another lamb. You know, you probably all know the history of when Martin Luther was a monk. He would go to confession five or six or ten times a day. And whatever, you know, he had a guy, a priest there who was his confessor, finally said to him, dude, you can't be coming over here ten times a day. Because Luther was absolutely overwhelmed with the idea that he was not a holy person and he was always doing wrong. And God was going to damn him at every time he said, oh, man, that guy over there is a jerk. And so he'd run to confession. Then, you know, there, run to con So when you're trying to follow law, it's very, very difficult. Because, but he says where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Because when Yeshua dies, when you, then when Yeshua is glorified, then the spirit's poured out in full measure, which is where we live. You know, as we come closer to Pentecost, Shavuot, which is coming right up, we're going to talk a lot more about that. But, but we, meaning believers, we, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We now see the Scripture unveiled, because now we understand where this was heading. This, now we understand where this was heading. Now we understand why Mount of the Transfiguration, Mount Tabor, Moses is there talking to Jesus. You know, Moses and Elijah are there. I think we did a thing about that. Moses and Elijah are there. The law and the prophets. They're talking to Jesus about his exodus that's going to happen in Jerusalem. So Moses comes and talks to Jesus about the fact he's going to go to Jerusalem and die. He wrote about blood atonement 1,500 years earlier, or however many years it was. So Paul's saying here, now we don't have a veil over the Scripture, because now we understand it. Now we can read Torah and say, oh, now we get this. Kill the lamb. Sprinkle the blood. Okay, I get this now. Life is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Oh, I get this now. Not that we understand it, but you see where it was coming from. You see where the point was. The writer to the Hebrews says everything was pointing to him. He says in five, John 5, 39, all those scriptures testify of me. All those scrolls that you've ever read are about me. When Paul preached and everybody checked the scriptures, like in Berea and some of these other places, what scripture did they have? The Old Testament. They only had the Tanakh. Paul doesn't say, well, I remember what I wrote to the Thessalonians, uh, but he hadn't written that yet. There was no New Testament. But the Old Testament, the Tanakh, was enough to put the foundation of what was going to happen when Messiah came. And through the Spirit, we understand these. So he compares the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he says, we use boldness. You know, if your salvation, if your faith in Yeshua means so little to you that you never mention it to anybody, that you never talk to anybody about it, that you sit around morose in your family room going, yep, that's really good news. Really glad. Uh, really glad I know about this. But yet, people are dancing for joy if their cholesterol went down 10 points. People are dancing for joy if they buy a new car. 
So he says, we use boldness because nothing means this much. We don't cover our faces. We don't, we understand the plain things that are in the scriptures. You know, the people that translated the Bible just before the Reformation and during the Reformation always had this saying they wanted a plowboy to be able to understand what was there. So in other words, you don't have to be a theologian to understand how you're saved or else that wouldn't be good. You know, that's why you have these Gnostic, the Gnostic heresy. Oh, you know, you only need, you have to really, in order to be saved, you have to be really smart. You have to understand all this stuff. You have to know all the hidden meanings of all this stuff. And we've got information you guys don't have. So, you know, I don't know. Hope things work out for you. That was a heresy because the Bible tells you plainly you know, Alistair Begg always likes to say the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. So we don't obscure the plain things. The plain thing is you got to shed blood to have your sin forgiven. You don't get your sin forgiven by saying, I'm going to give a dollar to that homeless guy. You don't get your sin forgiven by saying, I'm going to be nice today. You should be nice today, and you should give a dollar to the homeless guy. But without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. It sounds horrible. Who can read who can read through Leviticus? I mean verse by verse. Hey, we did like 18 chapters yesterday. Don't tell your Jewish friends. We did like 18 chapters in one sitting because we summarized it. Because if you read all the and they really are gory details, it would make you crazy. This animal for this, this animal for that. Burn the fat. Don't burn this. Put this over here. Put that. It's mind-numbing. But the issue is the sin is messy business. And so death is messy business. I spent 40 years seeing sick people of all different levels of sickness. And I always say to people, you have no idea what human beings go through. Because we live in a fallen world. Because we're in rebellion against God. Paul says, all men sin, therefore all men die. Death came into the world because of sin. Well, now sin is dealt with. You know, Paul says, Jesus is the second Adam. The first Adam was a failure. The first Adam brought death. The second Adam brings us life. So this is pretty good news. So we don't cover that stuff up. And if we do, it's pretty bad. As you read, you know, Moses couldn't see the complete truth. He had truth. He had the law. He was the only, well, he wrote the books of the law. No one else wrote the books of the law. The covenant with Israel was something nobody else had. So that was holy. And the Shekinah glory was the very presence of God, the very presence of the Spirit. And Moses did, in fact, glow when he came into contact with people after speaking to the Lord. It kind of reminds me of a friend of mine who was probably the most worldly person I ever met, um, just wanted to make money and live in a big house and retire when he was 50 and just live the good life. Um, got in a little trouble with the law because of Medicare and Medicaid billing. I'm not going to mention any names. And, um, you know, the feds came to his office one day and said, oh, we'd like to ask you a few questions. And he got so depressed he was going to kill himself. In fact, he was sitting in his basement and he was contemplating. He had two young kids at the time. He was contemplating what was going to happen to the kids if he killed himself. He didn't care so much about his wife. He cared about the kids because the kids were young. And so his wife had already become a believer, and there was a prayer meeting going on upstairs, and this elderly man came down into the basement and said to him, son, you need Christ, and you need him now. And he said, I can't be like you people. I don't believe any of that. I can't be like you people. And this guy led him to the Lord. He went back upstairs, and his wife did the testimony that as soon as he came through the basement door, she knew what happened because his face was glowing like Moses. 
was pretty cool. So he did glow, and the 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 symbolism of this is there's so much symbolism in the Tanakh that you couldn't see all of the truth, but it was a glorious thing because Moses did in fact glow. God's law should never be underestimated. It should never be minimized because it's it's holy. You want to be righteous? Here's how you're righteous. Oh, can't do it? Mm. Has anybody ever done it? No. The Pharisees, they set themselves apart. You know, God didn't set them apart. They set themselves apart. We keep the law. All those other people don't. We're holy. All those other people are a disaster. Look at that Yeshua. He doesn't even keep the Sabbath. How can, He can't be from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. And look at these ragtag, sorry guys following around. They don't keep the Sabbath either. These people are a disaster. We're the holy ones. And like the scrupulous, holy, you know, people who are scrupulous and legalistic, we'd call legalistic, you see at the morning of Good Friday when the high priest and all those people that are, you know, bringing Jesus to Pilate, they don't want to step on the praetorium because it was Passover and they didn't want to defile themselves. So I don't want to defile myself on Passover by stepping on the Gentile pavement, but I can plot to kill this guy. Right? That's why Jesus called them hypocrites and blind guides. And all humans are, but that's when you have a legalistic society, that's how you live. Oh, I have to do this. That guy doesn't do that. I do it. He doesn't do it. You know, that's why he said, you know, when you look at the you look at the speck in your brother's eye and you don't see the log that's in your eye. The Greek word there is for the weight bearing beam of a house. So you see some little fault that your friend has, and you got this big thing sticking out of your eye, and you don't even notice it. Pharisees. So they couldn't see the whole truth. But the gospel is much clearer than the law. The gospel is clear. Jesus died for you. It's the only way your sin can be forgiven. If you don't look to him, repent, have the metanoia, follow him, you're not going to be forgiven. You can read law all day long. And all the law is going to show you is where you've fallen. The law has no remedy for your problem. The law can't change you, right? Can't change you. It can't, you can try, you know, I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to do better with the law. But the law doesn't have the power to change you like the gospel does. Like probably everybody here, when they've had an experience, when they had an experience with Jesus, can tell you all of a sudden their life was different. I mean, I can't even tell you all of a sudden my life was different. Well, not all of a sudden, but over a couple of weeks, I, ha- I was a different. I was in a different life that I never thought about before. I could have studied law all that time, and I would have been, oh man, I'm never, gonna, <laughs> I'm never gonna be able to do this. What if my ox gores my neighbor? You know, what do I have to do with? The... <laughs> Where's Jordan? <laughs> but that is some of the law, of course. So, the gospel's the substance of what all of this pointed to. Okay, why could God not forgive Adam and Eve? Why didn't he just say, ah, oh, you guys, forget it. We'll forget to get rid of this tree. I'll, we'll, get, we'll get rid of the tree. Just, you know, try to do a better job from now on. If I tell you something else, try to do it. I wish you guys, no. Because if he overlooks sin, he violates his own nature. Because he's all holy and he's all just. But he's also all loving and all merciful. So all of that points to this. The love, ultimate love and mercy is the cross. Ultimate love and mercy is the cross. It's not how many candles you light. It's not how many steps you put going up to the temple. It's not whether the Sabbath starts at 601 or 602. It's blood atonement. And this has to be clear when you evangelize people. 
if you present a gospel to somebody and say, well, you know, Jesus will save you, but before he can save you, here's all the stuff you got to do. Or, you know, you got to be Torah observant, then put a little bit of Yeshua in, you know, here and there, or else forget it. You know, Paul condemns that all through Galatians. The Judaizers, the Judaizers, the Judaizers. That's not the gospel. Imagine being some card-carrying pagan. You know, we're all Gentiles here. You know, imagine our ancestors living in some pagan village somewhere in Europe, and here, here comes Paul and says, you know, Jesus died for you, and he's your savior, and here's all the things that happened. Here's all the prophecies. This applies to you too. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe I'm going to change my life. Okay, great. Now, here's what you have to do. First, you have to go, you have to get into the law of Moses, and then you can follow him. You say, wait a minute. That's not what I signed up for. Not because the law is bad. It's because the law points to this. The law points to the gospel. If you could keep the law, he wouldn't have had to die. If you go to heaven by being nice, he wouldn't have had to die. If you go to heaven by being good, he wouldn't have had to die. He could have just said, be good. Everything will be okay. You know, in Galatians 5, Paul says, the law is the schoolmaster that drives you to the cross. When you finally realize, I had, I'm a mess. You should keep the law. The moral law, you have to keep. But, you know, when you carry it to the extreme, then what are you going to do? You're a believer in Yeshua. You're going to sacrifice the lamb when the temple reopens or... The writer to the Hebrews says, if the first covenant was sufficient to save everybody, there wouldn't have had to be there wouldn't be need for a second covenant. He could have just come and brought the Gentiles into the first covenant. So we could see the whole plan from where we are. They really couldn't. They couldn't see how everything pointed to Yeshua, who was the end point of the law. He didn't come to abolish the law. He he was the fulfillment of the law. He said, one greater than the temple is here. One greater than Solomon is here. You believe Moses, you should believe me. Because this is what it's about. The Greek word is telos. Kind of like what you have with animals. The Greek word is telos. The end of the end point of the law. You know, Jesus summarizes the law by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all, like we say in the Via Hafta. Then he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on that. And so he becomes our righteousness because the law would be our righteousness if we could keep it. So what's the, what's the examples he uses? Well, you grow angry with your brother, it's the same as murder. And people say, what? If you call your brother a fool, you deserve a trial and hellfire. What? You look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery without doing the act. And everybody says, what? Then who can be saved? That's the logical question. Well, then who can be saved? Why was he saying those things? Because if you look at a woman with lust, you're violating the law. If you call your brother a fool, you're violating the law. If you yell and scream at your brother, you're violating the law. So you're already condemned. So he says, for man, it's impossible. How is he our righteousness? Well, Romans 10, 4, Paul writes, for Yeshua is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
2 Corinthians 5.21, that I always, that's chapter 5. I forgot to put the 5 in there. But this is the one everyone should memorize. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul doesn't say, okay, you Gentiles, you better get now into studying that law. First thing, you guys need to be circumcised. What? I'm not going to do that. Well, you're out. And you better stop eating that. Oh, you're out. <clears throat> so Moses and the prophets point to him. There was glory there, but that glory passes away when he comes. Because now he's the glory that's unveiled. Moses had to be covered because he was bright. Yeshua is the unveiled glory. He's the ultimate glory. You know, he's 40 days old. I love the presentation in the temple because he's 40 days old. And Simeon says, this child is the light to the nations and the glory of Israel. 40-day-old baby who cries, sleeps, pees, poops, eats, goes back to sleep wakes up, cries, make him stop crying. I'm trying. He's the glory of Israel. He's the light to the Gentiles. Whew. So a new glory, the glory is now unveiled. But when you read the Old Testament only and you don't know Yeshua, you still have that veil over your heart. Paul says that Israel's been temporarily blinded Temporarily blinded. We're starting to see it. Israel wake up now. You know, there's been a tremendous increase in believers in Israel since COVID. Tremendous. Yes. There's Messianic TV channels. There's Messianic radio channels. There's people coming into the streets, passing out tracts, and people taking them and reading them. There's people. There's a whole evangelical outreach based on Isaiah 53 where they talk to people at the wall or talk to people on the street and say, what does this mean? Well, I don't know. Don't you think this sounds like what happened to Yeshua? Well, kind of. <clears throat> I never thought about that. There's 229 Messianic congregations now. Um, 30 years ago, there were three. There's now 229. There were 30-some people who were well, at least admitted to being believers. I can't remember how many years ago. Now there's about 30,000. And it's been growing. It's been growing. The Israeli news channels have Christian broadcasting on them. They have ads for the local Christian ministries now. I mean, it, it's a tremendous thing that are happening because we know that just before Yeshua comes back, <coughs> Paul tells us all Israel will be saved. <clears throat> I hope it's tomorrow. <clears throat> so they're temporarily bl blinded, and this can only be removed by the Holy Spirit so that they can see Yeshua. Jesus himself said, when the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, then the people are going to understand. So here we are, a bunch of Gentiles from, you know, 33 AD on, Gentiles have been believing. Relatively few Jews have been believing proportionately. But eventually, this is going to stop because the scales are going to be removed, just like Saul's were. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 to 15. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Messiah. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil, li a, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. What happened to the veil in the temple? Torn from top to bottom. What time? 3 p.m. on Good Friday. What was happening then? He was dying on the cross. It was Passover. They got into a sort of a Yom Kippur tradition of at 3 p.m. on that Friday, they sacrificed a lamb for the sins of the people. 
So while they were doing that, the true lamb was dying outside the wall of the city. So he dies, says it's finished. Curtain tears from top to bottom. Holy of Holies is exposed. It doesn't tell us what Mr. Smarty Alec Caiaphas did at that point. But can you imagine being the one of the priests there and all of a sudden the veil tears behind you? Would have been pretty wild. So when you turn to him, the veil goes away. The veil separated the holy things from the unholy things. That's why churches look like this. You know, Christian churches don't look like this just because somebody liked the design. It's because it was what the temple looked like. It's what the tent looked like. But the writer to the Hebrew says, now, because Yeshua went through the veil with his own blood, we can approach the throne boldly. And we call God Abba, Daddy. Daddy, not Father, do you think you could, I mean, just, you think I could just say something to you? I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I don't want to. No, we call him Daddy. You say, Daddy, I don't understand what's going on. Like a little kid talking to their father. Because <clears throat> the veil's taken away. So when you read Moses and try to do the law, nothing wrong with reading Moses. I read Moses every day. We just had an awesome Torah class every, we have an awesome Torah class every Thursday morning. You know, podcast, radio, TV, all about Moses. And it's great, it's awesome. But when you read Moses and you try to do the law, you don't see what that pointed to. Jesus doesn't want to be part of your life. He doesn't want to be sort of a little supplement to your life that you have a little extra or something. He wants to be the center of your life, and he came to save you. He says, if you don't love, if you don't hate your father and your mother, don't come with me. If you want to go home and bury your father first, you, you lose. He's using hyperbole. He doesn't want you to hate your father and your mother. Doesn't, you know, he doesn't want you to pluck your eye out if you're sinning or cut your hand off if you're sinning. He's just saying this is how important this is. So he's not something you just add on to your life. You don't study the Old Testament and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we got Jesus too, but oh, look how awesome this is. And it is awesome. But he's the substance of it. He's the substance. And there's not two bodies. There's not a Jewish body and a Gentile body. What does Paul say? There's neither Jew nor Greek. Male or female, slave or free, all the things. We could add thousands of things to that. But if there's a Jewish body and a Gentile body, you know, what kind of church is that? You know, Gentile believers are not second-class citizens. We have the same grace, the same spirit, the same salvation. Romans 9.30, what shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. A rock. Where's the rock? In Zion. We love the rock. If you don't love the rock, it's a stumbling stone. It's a rock of offense. People are offended by Jesus. And certainly not just Jews. Turn your TV on. People are offended. You know, the New York Times uses Good Friday to publish an article that says, you know what, we got to forget about this God stuff. Like, let's just forget about it. Enough now. Now, there's somebody who doesn't worry about, what if I die today? Where am I going to be? Can you imagine saying that? It makes me cringe. So, if you believe, you won't be put to shame. 
But if you don't, it's a rock of offense and you stumble. And all this is taken away by understanding who he is, understanding grace, that this is what it comes to. It's grace. You know, Paul says in many places, you know, if, if you have to work for grace, then it's not a gift. Grace is unmerited favor. It points to grace. The whole plan points to this, and it's for everybody. It's for everybody. You watched that teaching yesterday? It's for everybody. Look at those verses in Isaiah. The verses in the Psalms talking about how the nations are going to come. The goyim are going to come. The goyim don't keep the law. They don't have a law. <clears throat> Hebrews 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Where is that from? Jeremiah 31, 31. I'm going to make a new covenant. The law is going to be written on their hearts. You know, Pentecost didn't happen on the Feast of Shavuot, Feast of Pentecost, which commemorated giving the law. It didn't happen by coincidence that the Holy Spirit was poured out that day because now he lives in us. He writes the law on our hearts, not on stone tablets, not on pieces of paper. Now we know who we are, where we go. Some person who I don't know, who apparently is my Facebook friend, sent me a thing last night. I don't know if they had, I don't know why they did it to me specifically, but it said, you know, I wonder why I'm here where I'm going, and what does this all mean? Don't you have those questions? I say, no. I said, I know who I am, I know where I'm going, and I know what all this means. So I'm waiting to see if she writes back. <laughs> so not understanding Yeshua kept keeps them from understanding the whole Hebrew scripture. It covers what the ultimate glory is covers it because he's the ultimate glory covers it <clears throat> and again when you turn to him it takes the veil away so paul says where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom it's freedom from bondage to sin it's freedom from the ceremonial law how annoying would it be to do this sacrifice thing over and over again it's mind-numbing it's like Luther running to confession every five minutes, except it would be worse because you'd have to go with an animal four or five times a day. Then the guy who's doing the sacrificing would say, you again? <clears throat> Where are you finding all these lamps? <laughs> Where's Jordan? <clears throat> so it's also freedom from the power of sin and from the guilt of sin. Because you know that your sin is forgiven. And I told you the story before, but I was a very new believer. And I went to a charismatic prayer meeting. And then I live in Avon. The meeting is in Twinsburg. And I started going every Sunday night because it was just so awesome. And there was a woman who was doing a talk. She was from Malaysia. She was this on fire woman who was talking about Holy Spirit power and stuff. And I'm sitting there going, I, I'm not even sure I know what she's talking about. So she called forward people who wanted prayer. So I thought, well, I'm going to go up. And she's going down the line and she's praying over people. And some people are being slain in the spirit and some people aren't. And there's all this like power in the room. So she comes to me. She looks me straight in the eye and she says, something from my past. So I'm not going to mention, of course, but something from my past and said, God has forgiven you for that. 
but you have to forgive yourself. And then she goes on to the next person. And I said, wait a minute, how do you know that? You don't even know me. <clears throat> because it's the power of the spirit. And when the spirit, but you know, the, the forgiveness takes away the guilt of your sin. Even though you've repented of it, you don't walk around feeling, you shouldn't walk around feeling guilty the rest of your life. And as I already mentioned, it's access to God in a completely different way, a completely new way. We can approach boldly. There was no approaching boldly in the tent or in the temple. You couldn't just go through the veil and say, Let's see what's going on back there. You know, how come those guys get to go back there? And I don't. Psst, and, that would, <laughs> and you were struck down. So you go from condemnation to justification, and your life has changed. The law can't really justify you. All it can do is condemn you. The law doesn't have a remedy to your problem. You're still a fallen human. <clears throat> you should still try to do the best you can. And it's good to follow law. It's good, especially the moral laws, are very important to follow. But if you feel like if I fail, then I'm cooked, that's pretty tough. There's forgiveness, even the guilt is removed and you're justified. So that's why he says, therefore, we have boldness of speech. And we're transformed from glory to glory. The law doesn't do that. The law leads to Pharisees saying, look at this Tephilim here. Look at this phylactery I have. Look at that stupid one you have. You shouldn't even be wearing one. You're a sinner. You don't keep the Sabbath. I saw you last Saturday. You were, oh, me? <laughs> Then, you know, like the guy who prays and says, thank you, Lord, for not making me like that guy. So it points to him. <clears throat>